The previous century was flooded with hundreds of secret missions that completely transformed the war strategy of the world. Apart from World War I and World War II, there are countless operations that left a significant mark on the pages of history. Of course, you might have heard of the Soviet Union and its secret barbaric operations. In today's video, we'll be talking about an operation in which the Soviet Union started a clandestine operation four decades ago to murder the Afghan president and take control of Kabul. On December 27, 1979, the attack was a violent prelude to the Soviet-Afghan war, which would send the nation on a path of decades of strife. Yes, we're talking about Operation Storm 333. Watch this video all the way to the end to learn about this ferocious operation that wreaked havoc on Afghanistan's ruling authority. If you're visiting this channel for the first time, make sure to smash the like button and subscribe to the channel for more exciting videos in the future. Now let's get straight into the video. Overview Operation Storm 333 was the code name for an operation on December 27, 1979, in which Soviet Union soldiers assaulted the Tajbeg Palace in Afghanistan and seized Afghan President Hafizullah Amin. An undetermined number of Afghan royal guards were murdered, while 150 were arrested. Amin's 11-year-old child perished as a result of shrapnel wounds. In the meantime, Babra Karmel was anointed as Amin's successor by the Soviets. Several additional government buildings were also seized during the operation, including the Ministry of Interior, the Internal Security, and even the General Staff Offices. This mission was one of the most successful missions of the Soviet Union, and veterans of the Alpha Group consider this operation to be one of the most spectacular in the group's history. Let's look at the history of this mission and the reasons why the Soviet Union took this step. Background as long as Nur Muhammad Taraki remained in charge of the Democratic Republic of Afghanistan, relations between Kabul and Moscow were cordial. Everything was going great between the two nations, and there was no big issue on the government level. Unfortunately, Hafizullah Amin removed Taraki from power in September 1979, when internal party struggle erupted. Amin's plans and objectives were utterly different from the ex-presidents which was alarming for both sides. By December, Afghan-Soviet relations had worsened due to the suspected killing of Taraki, perhaps by Amin's men, and the Soviet leadership had formed an alliance with Babra Karmal. Operation Storm 333, the first phase of the intervention, was launched on December 27, after the Soviet Union stated its intention to intervene on December 12. Soviet Forces the operation was carried out by 24 members of the Alpha Group's POM unit and 30 members of the KGB's Zenith Special Operations Unit, which eventually became known as Vimple. A company of the 345th Guards Airborne Regiment consisting of 87 soldiers also participated. It included 520 members from the 154th Separate Spetsnaz Battalion of the Soviet Ministry of Defense, nicknamed the Muslim Battalion, since it was made up entirely of soldiers from the southern republics of the Soviet Union. In addition, as the Afghan president could not depend on Afghan forces, a motorized rifle battalion was assembled in the Soviet Union earlier in 1979 at the special request of the Afghan president to secure his palace in Kabul. Although these support soldiers were not provided with shields or helmets, one of them even depicts that a magazine hidden under his pants shielded him from an SMG bullet during the war. Assault on the Palace and Death of Amin in 1979, President Amin and his family were residing in the Tajbeg Palace at the recommendation of his KGB security experts and were terribly assassinated on December 27. A total of nine armored personnel transporters, each with a crew of soldiers from the 154th Separate Spetsnaz Battalion, were utilized in the assault on the palace itself. Among those who rode in these vehicles were some of the 54 members of KGB Special Forces and 87 soldiers from the 345 Guards Airborne Battalion. In the same way that other components of Operation Dub attacked other strategic targets, soldiers from the 345th Airborne Regiment worked closely with the 130 members of the Zenith Brigade. The latter was headquartered in Kabul throughout this mission. The KGB units were responsible for five deaths, but the paratroopers suffered a greater death toll of nine. Colonel G.I. Boyarinov, the KUOS officer's perfectioning school chief, where Zenith personnel were trained, was among those who died in the attack. It was a significant loss for his team. Almost all of the KKB troops were injured, but those who could still wield weapons continued to battle on. Six soldiers from the 154th Spetsnaz Battalion, closed in Afghan clothes and charged with formally protecting the palace grounds on behalf of the Afghan president, were killed. The majority of them were BMP crew members who carried troops to the palace doors. The Soviet Union was still on Amin's side, and he expressed this belief to his adjutant, who said, the Soviets will support us. The adjutant responded that it was the Soviets who were assaulting them, 
to which Amin initially responded that this was a complete fabrication. Then, only after he had attempted but failed to call the Chief of General Staff, did he voice the whispered phrase, I had a feeling it was coming. It's all real, believe me. He was taken alive by Grom forces, although he was only semi-conscious and experiencing convulsions. No eyewitness has ever been able to establish the precise circumstances of his death after he was found. According to the New York Times on December 27, 1979, the official announcement of his execution on Kabul radio was that Amin had been condemned to death in a revolutionary tribunal for crimes against the state, and that sentence had been carried out. According to one version at the time, Amin was slain by Gulabzoi, a prior minister of communication who had been expelled by Amin and who, along with two other previous ministers, had been present during the attack, lending validity to the idea that it was an Afghan-controlled operation. Ultimately, it was Gulabzoi and Watanjar, the former minister of defense, who were the ones to announce his death. This account of his killing after a summary trial is reinforced by the fate of Amin followers who were arrested and condemned to death by a revolutionary troika and then murdered on the spot with a gunshot on the back of the neck by the same group. Amin's son was critically injured and died as a result of his injuries. A daughter was injured, but she was still alive. The battle claimed the lives of around 100 additional Afghans, including the majority of Amin's personal guard of 40 men and other palace guards. A portion of the palace was destroyed by fire. When the invading forces learned that they were not from an Afghan regiment but rather from the Soviet Union, around 150 of the 180 palace guards who were regular troops surrendered. And the reason behind their surrender was that they luckily realized and confessed that the attacking forces were from the USSR, not from an Afghan unit. Soviet losses There were nine paratroopers killed in the Tajbeg attack, as well as five KGB special forces officers, six members of the Muslim battalion, and five members of the Muslim brigade. Colonel Boyaranov, the commanding officer of the KGB unit, was assassinated. Almost every member of the KGB forces who took part in the operation was injured or killed. Colonel V. P. Kuznetchenkov of the Soviet Army, who was treating President Amin at the time, was killed in the palace by friendly fire and was later awarded the Order of the Red Banner. According to the Mitrokin archive, it is said that nearly a hundred KGB personnel were slain before the palace was captured and Amin was shot down. In the article, The KGB in Afghanistan, written by Vasily Mitrokin, it is stated that about 700 members of the KGB from both the center and the periphery were dropped into Kabul to participate in Operation Agat. In Afghanistan, the soldiers were outfitted in army uniforms. During the assault on the palace, more than 100 members of the KGB were murdered. Because of the enormous number of casualties, Andropov questioned whether it was appropriate to display pictures of heroes who died while carrying out their great worldwide mission in the hallways and corridors, since doing so would draw undue attention to themselves and their families. Memoirs of the Participants It was headed by two elite units of Alpha and Zenith, 15 to 20 soldiers each, according to Oleg Balashov, the commanding officer from Alpha who led the attack. The Alpha squad was tasked with assassinating Amin, while the Zenith unit was tasked with gathering proof that Amin was conspiring with the United States of America. Both teams were transported to Afghanistan in secret and mixed in with Muslim battalions in order to give the appearance that the operation was carried out by locals. But in fact, Alpha and Zenith were responsible for practically all of the work. Balashov conducted surveillance of the region before the operation, while posing as a bodyguard for a Soviet ambassador. His troop was aware that they were entering a death zone and was uneasy with the prospect of doing so. Almost 80% of them were injured immediately after leaving their trucks, but they persisted in their attack. Amin's forces targeted the first and final vehicles in the convoy of six vehicles, just as Balashov had predicted. In the front BMP, he stationed his squad of five men, and when the BMP became immobilized by fire from Amin's forces, he ordered them to leave the BMP and flee to the palace, which they did. The guards fired a barrage of bullets and immediately injured all five, but their bulletproof jackets and helmets kept them alive. That's all for today's video. If you've just stumbled across this channel for the first time, make sure to hit the like button so you never miss a video from us. Until next time.